I have always been restless. Throughout my college years, I yearned to break free of the classroom and apply my knowledge in real life. My college experience was not one where I went away for four years to learn how to navigate in the real world. I worked full time and went to school around my work schedule. I was living in the real world and realized that my education was not only going to come from books. In a year that would change America forever, my life took a drastic turn that would lead me to D.C. three months after September 11, 2001. In December of 2001, I arrived at the Baltimore-Washington International Airport amid armed National Guardsmen to begin an internship with the American Bar Association's Central European and Eurasian Law Initiative. As a committed student of history, I was fascinated with Eastern Europe and the post-Soviet world and as an African-American woman from Alabama. I saw this as a chance to change the direction of my life. I wanted to serve my country, and D.C. seemed to call me like a siren song. I loved this city. Everything that mattered happened here. Reality, ever the constant companion, did not let me revel in my fantasies for too long. The internship was unpaid, full-time, and in one of the most expensive cities to live in, America. My indoctrination as a community organizer began during this time. I attended meetings with brilliant legal minds at day, and after losing my housing, walked the, cr the crime-laden streets in the worst parts of D.C. at night. I never felt sorry for myself and was determined to make things work. At this point, there was little that could affect my idealism. On weekends, I talked to moms who struggled to keep their kids from crime and drugs, teenagers who were bused to clinics for AIDS medication every day, homeless people, my people. I was never really afraid of meeting people because their stories inspired me. Their stories inspired something in me. I would later come to express these feelings in my artwork. In 2002, I traveled overseas as a short-term election observer for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, but my heart was now in the community. After returning to Alabama, I longed to come back to D.C. Not all of my experiences here were good, and some were downright traumatizing but I refused to believe that the current state of the poor in D.C. was fixed. Fast forward to 2005, and I am having a phone interview with Nathan Henderson James of Acorn Political Operations. I explained my D.C. experience and how the disparities between the two worlds I existed in seemed manufactured and unfair. He praised my credentials and said that with my experience, I could negotiate a higher salary with ACORN than the standard 25500 I had just been promoted to T-Mobile Corporate in Maryland at a much higher salary, but decided to take a chance on ACORN. Upon arriving at the ACORN office on Barracks Row in Capitol Hill, the first thing I was told was that I would work for an organization called Project Vote. This was confusing to me since during the interview, Nathan sold me on the ACORN principles and I had attended an ACORN group interview a year earlier and never heard of Project Vote. Over the next few months, I realized that I should not have worried. ACORN and Project Vote were one in the same. I attended the 2005 YEYB in Houston, Katrina moved us from New Orleans, and my education in the ways of ACORN had begun. As a novice, it was easy to turn a blind eye to things or claim ignorance, but as my responsibilities grew and I began taking nonprofit classes at the Foundation Center, several things became glaringly obvious. As development associate for the Strategic Writing and Research Department, 
I conducted surveys of election officials for information on provisional voting and voter fraud. On the project vote side, I began making the deposit forms for all grant transactions in 2006. A small nonprofit is not like other businesses. You wear many hats, and at times I was the only project vote employee in the DC office. This unprecedented access to files from old offices, files found on the old computers I kept getting, combined with my intense desire to learn about the organization so that I could move up and work with the people, led to my discovery of ACORN's questionable practices. The veil of my idealism was totally gone by early 2007. While pregnant, I suffered through having to apply for WIC and medical assistance because my ACORN pay of 25500 never got that raise, left me with little to live on and inadequate insurance. The company provided insurance was a joke and the doctors were hard to find or no longer in, in the program. Claims were often approved for coverage but then denied, resulting in high medical debt that helped lower my credit score. My paychecks were frequently late or missing, so much that CCI payroll recognized me by name at the annual report to staff. Late paychecks resulted in overdraft fees, late rent, and eventually a 11-day hold on all deposits by my bank. Working for Acorn was never easy, but I used to think it was worth it. In mid-2007, after receiving an email about an EAC grant, I called the people behind www.rottenacorn.org and tried to let them know <coughs> that something was terribly wrong. The man warned me that the fight would not be easy and I needed to find other employment for myself and then call back. I was not strong enough then and would live to regret not leaving Acorn then. I needed the paycheck and I put my misgivings on the back burner and tried to change Acorn from within. I contacted senior management including Zach Pollitt about proper training, diversity hiring, and promotion programs. I wrote a guideline for diversity and presented it in November of 2007 and talked personally with Zach about the problems that existed across the board in ACORN. ACORN is not an organization that you can survive working in once you have a family. And through it all, like my experience as an intern, my low income situation caused havoc in my personal life. After being thrown out of a complex for complaining to the health department about mold, I told Nathan how tenants in month-to-month -month leases had no rights in Maryland, and as usual, the true plight of the people like me who we serve was ignored. I ended up with a five-month-old in a rat-infested house in Baltimore. After moving in, I asked the landlord about pests, and the slumlord replied, Why, do you see any? I was desperate, and I took the place. Within three months, I realized that Baltimore had a problem with large sewer rats that held me hostage as they ran around the house at night. They were so big that I actually went to Walmart to buy a pellet gun in case they attacked me or my daughter. <clears throat> Commuting back and forth from Baltimore in an SUV with gas gas prices at 450 plus was not ideal in 2007 turned out to be a year that would bring about my darkest times at night I watched over my daughter and during the day I was a wreck at work I had to move I needed cash for a deposit and first month's rent but still needed to live I began using a Project Vote credit card for food, diapers, formula, etc.